Okay, so let's get back to work at our study of space-time algebra, which is also going to be a study of geometric algebra, right? Geometric space-time algebra is a sub, well, it's an instance of geometric algebra. I guess that's the best way to say it. So in our last lecture, we basically got through this sort of introductory section on the space-time algebra. So now we are going to move into these two sections, space-time and space-time product. So let's begin. So section 3.1 describes, is beginning to describe the special relativity of space-time. So this is where this paper really sort of focuses on the physics an application of geometric algebra to physics. So it leads with physics, right? It's leading with the subject of space-time. Most treatments of geometric algebra lead with the mathematics of the geometric algebra. Um, being a physicist, I just prefer it this way. However, uh, I've read plenty of papers that go the other direction. It starts with a study of geometric algebra and uh, in total generality, and then it applies it to space-time. So, but this going the other way, I feel like it, it actually kind of slips into the subject a little bit better. And it starts very, very sort of obviously, right? It says that we have uh, in special relativity, you postulate. Postulate is an important word here because special relativity is a presumption about space-time. You can't just, you can't develop it from simpler principles, really. You have to make assumptions, although to be honest, that's true of any physical theory, Right. But you, the, postulation, the postulate of space-time is you have a scalar time, and they like to say vector spatial coordinates. That's just a way to say the spatial coordinates are bundled up into a group of three, and that those three can be treated as uh, vectors in a particular reference frame, right? And, uh, but you always have the scalar time involved. And then special relativity has an invariant interval, ct squared minus the magnitude of that vector squared. And right there, we immediately answer the question about the signature. Clearly, this signature for this is going to be 1 minus 1 minus 1 minus 1, which is the opposite of the signature we used in the class on uh, what is general relativity, which not a big deal. Um, you, we should all be familiar with both of them. So, so far, this is a very simple explanation of special relativity. And then they want to say an elegant way of coding this physical postulate is to combine the scaled time and spatial components into a four vector, right? This is a, a four vector that locates an event in space time with a squared length equal to the invariant interval. So when you square the length of this four vector, you're supposed to get this. And of course, the only way that's true is if you use the Minkowski metric to do the squaring. And then that's what they describe down here. In terms of the comp these two four vectors here, in a certain particular inertial frame, we say a dot b is commutative, right? a dot b equals b dot a. And it is the Minkowski metric applied to a and b, which is a0, b0 minus a1, b1 minus a2, b2 minus a3, b3. And then there they reaffirm the, um, the signature. So now they have a vector space, right? Because you can add the position of two events in space-time. You can subtract them as long as you understand uh, you're dealing with a scalar time and a vector position. And, uh, and it's got this Minkowski metric of plus, minus, minus, minus. So they want to say the vector space of all these four vectors, they're going to call, they're going to give it a name. And that name is M13 right here. So M13 is just the vectors, the vector space of space time, and it's an inner product space with a Minkowski metric. So no geometric algebra so far. So in the next paragraph, uh, all physical vector quantities in special relativity are postulated to be four vectors in this new vector space M13 that we've just uh, identified, right? So all physical quantities, four vectors in M13, but that, that satisfy the Minkowski metric, right? That's, of course, everything must. Otherwise, it would literally violate special relativity. So they want to say now that these vectors are called geometric quantities. Well, uh, these vectors are geometric quantities, 
because, um, not because, but they do not depend on the choice of reference frame. And that's true, right? We That's the whole deal with special relativity is you want to find those things that are independent of reference frame. And as such, without a reference frame, we're going to call them proper relativistic objects. So we'll look for this language as we read this paper, proper relativistic objects. And um, uh, then they talk a little bit about how the Minkowski metric is different from the Euclidean metric, which I think we all know. We have time-like, space-like, and light-like. That's fine. But let's get to this definition that they use in this paper that isn't very typical. And that's this notion of the pseudonorm, the pseudonorm of a four vector. And that's given as a dot a, which is just the magnitude of the vector. But they want it to, uh, they want to break this up into this structure here. They want to have it as an absolutely positive part, which is this magnitude of a squared right here, right? And they want this epsilon, which is either plus or minus one. So they'll give it a sign separate from its magnitude. And that sign is going to be called the signature, right? And they use this a bunch in this paper. So, uh, so the magnitude of a, ve of a four vector, they're pointing out, it can be positive, zero, or negative. And the positivity or negativity is captured by the signature of this magnitude, of the pseudonorm, right? They're going to call this a pseudonorm, and they break it into these two parts, the signature and this positive magnitude. Now, in the next paragraph, they present a conundrum. It takes them a while to get there, but they do get there. What they're basically saying here is that now we have this vector space M13 of all these four vectors, and there are certain things that it does very well. You can model... Uh, uh, space-time events, the space-time itself in M13, and you can model the uh, energy momentum vectors, right? This is uh, the momentum. This is the, the energy piece of a momentum, of a four momentum. Those do very well. And you can also, um, you, but you cannot take, they notice right away, you can't take the electric field and the magnetic field and somehow create a four vector out of the electric and magnetic field. And they point out that in order to handle the electric and magnetic field relativistically, you've got to create, you've got to create these, this tensor, the electromagnetic field tensor, F. And we've done that already together in our prerequisite class. So we've seen this, and we understand how this, this tensor uh, is manifestly invariant and it represents the only way to express the, the electromagnetic field independent of coordinates. So, so now they argue, you know, that's okay. It's formally correct, is what they're saying. But it's conceptually opaque, they've decided. And then they ask the questions, why does a single rank two tensor F mu nu decompose into two three vector quantities E and B in a relative frame? So let's look at that question. You have a rank two tensor, right? You have, we have F mu nu. And then F mu nu is the only way to speak about the electromagnetic field in total generality, regardless of what frame you're in. But if you do choose one particular frame, then you can peel this apart and you can create um, a three vector B and a three vector E that's good for that particular frame, right? So they're asking, well, why does this two rank tensor decompose like that? And then, so to them, that's a question. Now, we, we sort of understand how the decomposition is done, right? We understand that when you get this object, you put it in a particular frame, you can read off the B field and you can read off the E field, right? Remember how this thing worked, right? You had, you had um, uh, E, X, E, Y, and E, Z, and then you had a section that had B in it that was, uh, you know, and then you had, I think, minus E, X, minus E, Y, 
Uh, there, let me just write it a little neater, right? We know that this, these are the components. So you can read off the components of the three of the, of the uh, magnetic field out of this bulk of the matrix, and you can read off the components of the electric field off of these columns. And once you just transform this into the right frame, you can read off these three vectors, right? So what they're saying is, you know, well, why is that? I mean, it seems pretty obscure or difficult, I guess, is what they're after. And they want to know, is there some deeper significance to the mathematical space in which the tensor F mu nu resides, right? Notice this tensor does not reside in M13. M13 is a vector space of four vectors, right? Only four vectors live there. F mu nu is not a four vector. It's a tensor. It's a rank two tensor. So it lives in some other mathematical space, right? And... Um, so then he asks, do the proper tensor descriptions have any geometric significance in Minkowski space? Right? Well, Minkowski space is what this M13 is supposed to be. So what is the geometrical significance of this guy inside of this space? It seems strange that we have to introduce something else in Minkowski space to model something so basic as the electromagnetic field. So he's upset about that. And I, I get it. I see the point. It's a, it's a question I never asked. I just learned the math and kept going, right? But so evidently, the vector space M13 does not contain the complete physical picture implied by special relativity, since it must be augmented by quantities like F, which are outside the space, right? So... The simple vector space of four vectors isn't enough. You've got to add new quantities to make it work. Okay, frankly, what he says there is, is somewhat obvious, but it's not typically something we would articulate to ourselves. We just keep, like I said, we learn things, move on, realize, oh, wow, it's this two-rank tensor. Um, how cool. Now, also in this paragraph, he alludes to some, another example of uh, angular momentum, which he calls M, and he uses from L. We're, we're going to skip that for now. It's not, uh, it's not particularly necessary. So that is... The, so the foundation of this section, this section here, 3.1, is it tells us, hey, we're using this... We're basically creating Minkowski space, M13, the space of all four vectors, and it has this signature. And then he gives us a little bit of his... Uh, notational conventions. And then he poses the question, how do we expand or how do we broaden uh, Minkowski space in order to contain all of the things it needs to describe electromagnetism? All right, so then we will now move on to the next section. And that next section is the space-time product. So we continue. To obtain a complete picture of special relativity in a systematic and principled way, we make a critical observation. Any physical manipulation of vector quantities uses not only addition, but also vector multiplication. So here we're talking about turning something into an algebra. Remember, M13 is just a vector space. That's only a vector space, right? It is not an algebra, right? Because this notion, we didn't really... Uh, we, we allowed it to have an inner product, right? So it does have an inner product. But the way we've defined this vector space, we haven't defined uh, any form of multiplication of two vectors, two four vectors that would give you another four vector. So we don't have a vector multiplication yet in M13. So that's what's going to be added here. So indeed... Standard treatments of electromagnetism involve relative three vectors. Okay, so when he uses the word relative three vectors, whenever you see that in this paper, this word relative means um, uh, per it means a particular frame of reference, a particular frame of reference. That's what he means by relative three vectors. We've chosen a basis, we've got a frame of reference, and with that basis, we can use dot products and cross products to discuss the physical implications of the theory. Now, the physical implications of the theory, when he's talking about that, think Maxwell's equations, right? You have cross products, you have dot products, you have curl, right, and divergences, which are sort of the calculus version of the 
vector cross product and vector dot product. But as you learned electromagnetism, you learned how these uh, three vectors, these relative three vectors, because whenever we studied it uh, initially, right, we were in a definite reference frame, a definite frame of reference, and we knew how to take dot products, we knew how to take cross products, and then when we got good, we learned how to take curls and divergences and all kinds of calculus. So the symmetric dot product and the anti-symmetric vector cross product to discuss the implications of the theory. So that means to discuss Maxwell's equations. All right. Um, so, however, the, they point out the vector space M13 only specifies the relativistic version of the dot product in the form of the Minkowski metric. Right. So there is a dot product in M13. It's the inner product. Right. It's not it's not vector multiplication like we need for an algebra. Remember, it is just vector multiplication. Um, well, it's not even vector multiplication. It is a bilinear product that takes two vectors and produces a scalar. And in this case, it's through the Minkowski metric. So it's an inner product. Um, without introducing the proper relativistic notion of the cross product, the physical picture of the space-time is incomplete. So M13, as it stands, has no type of cross product, which would be one vector crossed into another vector yielding a third vector. M13 is full of four vectors, and we don't have a cross product introduced on the whole thing. And that's uh, a big omission, because without that, we can't, without having that ability, we can't study Maxwell's equations or anything else. So mathematically, they, they go on to say, Mathematically, the introduction of a product on a vector space creates an algebra. Now, we, we talked about that in the last lesson, so that's clear. See, that's what I mean. I'm going to try to fill in the holes a little bit. Right? I'm going to expand on these sentences. Hence, we seek to construct the appropriate algebra for space-time from the vector space M13 by introducing a suitable vector product. So this is the, this is, this is the whole program right here, right? Uh, we seek to construct the appropriate algebra for space-time. So space-time, they're basically saying, look, M13, not good enough. The vector space of all four vectors, not good enough. First of all, you need to promote this thing to some kind of algebra, right? And then when you have this algebra, it'll understand everything we know, everything we want to know about space-time or everything we do know about space-time will be embedded inside this algebra. So all manipulations, all physical things that exist in space-time should be modeled inside the algebraic structure we create, and that is what we're after. We're trying to create an algebraic structure that can model anything we know about in space-time that, uh, that, that has been amenable to our analysis, right? Which is the electromagnetic field and movement and things like that. Now, I got it with the caveat I'm not sure how general relativity will ultimately fit into all of this. I have no doubt there's somebody out there who's taken this work and shown how it applies to general relativity. But right now, for everything we do here, we're not assuming any gravity. So if we assume later on massive objects moving around, we're not going to consider um, their effect on the metric. The metric is always going to be flat Minkowski metric everywhere. Okay. So the way they say they're going to do this is they're going to take M13 and introduce a suitable vector product. Now, it's really interesting how this is done. You'll see it in a moment. It's so unbelievably simple. It's kind of mind-bogglingly simple, which I find really, really impressive. But anyway, we expect this vector product to be non-commutative since the familiar cross product is non-commutative. So what they're getting at here is they're basically running on instinct here. They're saying hey, the cross product is so important in how we've learned and we understand electromagnetism that we know its properties have got to surface somewhere in this program that we have of creating the appropriate algebra for space-time. So if we're going to introduce a vector product, it's, it's, we know that the cross product is not commutative. So this vector product is the only new thing we're adding. We're only adding one thing to our, to our uh, vector space M13. And so we're going to speculate that 
whatever it is, is it's non-commutative because it's got to be able to capture whatever cross product has given us. It's got to be captured by this. So ultimately, since it's the only thing we're adding, it's got and the dot the uh, the dot product or the um, the inner product is already commutative. Well, this thing better be non-commutative. So um, I, I guess the, the theory there is that if you add a commutative vector product, it's hard to imagine how it would be, since everything's linear, it's hard to imagine how anything, any non-commutativity would ever show up. So that's why they're going with non-commutative. We also expect the vector product to enlarge the mathematical space. Now, this is an important point. I touched on it last week or last lesson. It's going to enlarge the mathematical space in order to properly accommodate quantities like the electromagnetic field tensor. Okay, so whoa. We're going to introduce a multiplication operation, right? Which, like, for example, we call star, say right? Where we can take a vector and we can star it to another vector. Now, as I said before, this has got to yield us yet another vector, right? That's what an algebra does. An algebra has an operator. That's, this is the appropriate multiplication that we need. And yet, we're seeking to enlarge the mathematical space. So what does that mean? Well, we've kind of enlarged it by adding this multiplication, but that's not what they mean. What they mean is when we talk about the vector space M13, right? It's got four vectors in it, right? It contains four vectors. So a good four vector might be, we'll call it X and Y and Z. These are four vectors inside M13. And of course, we've got the addition operation, We've and um, uh, each of these four vectors has this sort of scalar time part and this three vector space part. That's what everything in here has. To enlarge the space means that not only are we going to have these four vectors in there, right? Not only are we going to have these four vectors in there, we're actually going to add other mathematical objects that we yet don't fully know about. And those things are not four vectors, but they're going to be part of this space, which means you should be able to take a four vector and add it to the, one of these unknown enlarged things and get something else that is also inside the space. So this vector addition must accommodate the four vectors that are already there and whatever this enlargement that they're teasing is going to be. So suddenly space-time, M13, it's no longer M13. It's got to be, we got to have to rename it to something else because the set is different. Uh, M13 was the set of all these four vectors, and this new thing that we're making is four vectors plus this stuff, and it's just simply bigger. So that's what they're teasing here. They're going this, we're going to be forced, and you'll see why in just a second, we're going to be absolutely forced to enlarge the space after we introduce this non-commutative product. Uh, and that enlarged space should have room for this guy. It should have room for this uh, uh, magnetic field uh, tensor or something equivalent to it. So uh, let's see, what are they going to do? And, well, here it is, right? To accomplish these goals, we define an appropriate space-time product. So this is what they were calling the Clifford product. The Clifford product is the general product for all geometric algebras. That would be the Clifford product. When you particularize everything to the study of the particular Clifford geometric algebra that is applied to space-time, he's going to call it the space-time product or the authors here will call it the space-time product. So instead of calling it the Clifford product, I'll try to call it the space-time product. So we define the appropriate space-time product to satisfy the following four properties for any vectors in A, B, and C, for any vectors A, B, C inside this our Minkowski uh, vector space. And the first is that it's associative, which we talked about in the last lesson. Now, they don't use arrows, right? So A, B, and C are vectors. 
and vectors meaning they're elements of this. They're four vectors, right? These are four vectors inside Minkowski space. So if I had a space-time product, I know it'll be associative among these four vectors. I also know it will be uh, linear. It'll be linear uh, uh, against the uh, addition property for vectors. And notice it's linear on both sides, right? This is why it's called bilinear. But this last one, this last one, that's where all the magic happens, right here, right here. Because what this is saying is that the space-time product of A with itself, which is what we're going to call A squared, right, that is equal to this guy over here on the right. And notice what this guy is. This guy is the magnitude of A, which is eta A A, right, which is a number right? It's eta a a, which is a number. Um, this whole thing equals eta a a, and it's, it's a number. It's a real number. So we have now the problem that, well, we, we have the fact, I guess, that this is an assertion, right? We are asserting this. We are saying this is a property of the multiplication that we are choosing, that we are inventing. We are inventing the space-time product, and I want it to be associative, I want it to be bilinear, but I also want it to be that when you take the space-time product of a four-vector with itself, you end up with a number, a real number, which violates this tenant that a vector times a vector must equal another vector, right? And there's our first degree of expansion. That is, we need to take M13, right? We're taking M13, and to that we are attaching the real numbers, right? We're binding them together, and this new thing our, our algebra, our final algebra, our final space-time algebra has to have at least all of the vectors that could possibly exist in M13 and all of the real numbers that could possibly exist in R. Uh, uh, I'll say R, I'll, I'll give them a little, a little, I call, I call these vectors here uh, A, B, and C because that's what they did here. Uh, he doesn't really have a real number here, so I'll just throw down epsilon, all the possible real numbers. So this vector space is now a bigger object, and it's a bigger object exclusively because, so far, of this statement, right? This statement here has forced us to add real numbers to this vector space we're talking about. Then after that, he goes on to um, offer a little bit of uh, anticipation, a little bit of insight on what's to come. But he's saying that the contraction property distinguishes the resulting space-time algebra as an orthogonal Clifford algebra that is generated by the metric eta and the vector space M13. So he's basically just saying, hey, look, there's a lot of prior work on this, right? Hastenis didn't invent uh, a lot of this. I think he, he spent a lot of time flushing it out and making it, um, uh, applying it to its full level, that uh, to its full potential. Um, I don't know how much pure research uh, he did as he developed this theory for us. I, I should check into the history of it. But what he's basically saying is this thing here, that's been around for a while. And it, even you know, Clifford was the guy who came up with it. And it also states without proof or anything that this Clifford algebra is the largest associative algebra that can be constructed solely from space-time. So starting with M13 and this provision, this contraction uh, assumption of the multiplication property, starting with those two things, the algebra that you're gonna, we're ultimately going to build here is the largest one you can possibly make that's also associative. Um, okay, fine, not, not something that I'm going to hunt down. Tempted, but not going to. Indeed, this nesting of algebra, so, so the point is, is, is all other algebras that could ever be relevant must be buried inside 
this largest algebra and that therefore um, we should see every algebra we've ever seen before tucked away as a subalgebra of this algebra. Obviously, a, the notion of a subalgebra is just like a vector subspace, right? It's a completely closed subset of our space-time algebra that's closed under, obviously, all the vector operations, but also closed under all of the uh, these multiplication operations as well. So, and, and we'll see in this paper, they really do go out of their way to show how these algebras nest together. And, um, and so that's the point where we want to sort of stop for now, is we have actually now introduced the key point from which everything else really flows, which is this contraction, uh, this contraction property of the space-time product. And we've already shown a little bit about how we can expect that to uh, take M13 and blow it up into something bigger. Uh, that includes all of the vectors of M13, all the four vectors of M13. And uh, notice how the language works. M13 is a vector space, so everything in it is a vector. However, the things inside M13 we've been used to call, we, we, have, we, we usually call four vectors because four vectors are the things that we learn about in relativity. So the vectors of M13 are actually are called four vectors, right? But that doesn't mean they're special vectors. Everything in M13 is a vector. And in fact, we're blowing up N13 to be even bigger. So the scalars are part of this new algebra. So the vector space that we've expanded to includes scalars. So now scalars are vectors in the vector space, as well as four vectors. So you can see how the language just spirals out of control here. And um, maybe just before we step away, we're, I'm going to lock this down. All right, hold on. All right, so the idea is M13 contains all of the four vectors we can ever think of. Now, M13 is a vector space. So every element of the vector space, I know I've said this to death, but they're called vectors. However, in relativity, the objects that we use to add and subtract, and model physical reality, those are called four vectors. So the vectors of the M13 vector space are four vectors, all right? That's just an unfortunate, overloaded use of the word vector, and it gets worse, right? So now what we're learning is that, okay, we, want to, we need to create our algebra here, so we introduce this product where you take any two vectors, A and B, right? And you spaced and you and you multiply them together using what we're calling the space-time product, right? And that result, whatever that result is, it has to equal something that's inside the algebra, right? So if the algebra was limited to M13, it would have to be another four vector, right? It would have to be some four vector C. But what we've discovered right away is that A, A is actually just a real number, right? It's a real number. I'll call it, uh, uh, well, I'll call it, I don't want to call it epsilon. I'll call it, uh, I'll call it sigma. It's a real number sigma. And sigma is an element of the real numbers, right? So the problem is, of course, that this is not in M13, right? So if we believe that this is how our vector product works, then the, these real numbers have to suddenly become part of the vector space. And now we no longer have M13 as we're now dealing with a different vector space. We're dealing with a vector space that not only contains four vectors, where the four vectors is referent to the vectors of relativity, but also contains real numbers, right? So we've now added, so we, we have, you know, sigma, pi, eta, uh, psi, all of these, all phi, right? All of these theta, you know, all of these real numbers are now part of this as well. So now whatever the vector space is that we've expanded to in order to create this algebra, the underlying vector space that's creating the algebra has four vectors and real numbers. But remember, 
everything in a vector space is called a vector. So these guys are also vectors, right? They're just vectors that we typically call, we typically call these things real numbers, right? Real numbers. But because they're members of the vector space, we, they're, they're, they're vectors in that sense, right? But what's even more disturbing is if I have a four vector, which I call A, and a, a real number, which I call sigma, I have to be able to write A plus sigma, which is kind of crazy, right? Because I'm writing x0, x1, x2, x3, and then I've got this vector addition, which normally just allowed me to add four vectors to one another, but I've got this vector addition, and I'm adding to it this real number sigma, which has got to be legit. i got to be able to do it because that's a vector from the vector space, and this is a vector from the vector space. This operates on all vectors on the vector space, so I've got to get something else over here that's also a member of the vector space. So that's where... Um, uh, I just wanted to emphasize this language. We use the word vector in a lot of ways here um, in order to get on top of this. But so far, I don't know if we fully expanded. Uh, we, we know that we've added one thing to the vector space in order to create our algebra, but we may have to add other things. Indeed, we definitely do have to add other things to the vector space in order to make the algebra. Good news is we don't have to add an infinite number of things, right? Um, we, we are, well, we do add it like the real numbers. There's an infinite number of real numbers. So we have in some sense already added an infinite number of things. But we don't have to add an infinite number of different kinds of things, I guess is the way to say it. We're going to add real numbers and we're going to add a whole bunch of other stuff uh, in the next lesson. And okay, in the next lesson, we will actually start exploring this, the all the implications of this contraction property. We will begin to explore and study in detail. And that's when we start getting into the meat of the subject. So I'll see you next time.